The event will begin shortly. In the meantime, we invite you to prepare your favorite hot drink and check the technical requirements. Please turn on your camera and turn off your microphone. To ask questions, use the raise hand icon during interaction time or type your question in English in the chat box. This evening, we have a surprise for you from our friends of Café Caribe. We will award one of you today at the end of the activity, so active participation is always welcome. En Café Caribe, tostamos granos de café cuidadosamente seleccionados desde 1979. Nuestras mezclas han sido elaboradas y desarrolladas por expertos internacionalmente reconocidos, obteniendo una gran variedad de exquisitos productos a disposición de nuestros clientes. Contamos con una planta de producción de última generación con maquinaria 100% italiana. Esto nos faculta sacar lo mejor de cada grano y obtener un producto final de alta calidad e incomparable sabor. Además, nos destacamos por tostar en Chile, lo que nos permite obtener una mayor frescura, sabor y aroma que nos caracteriza y a la vez diferencia de los cafés tostados en el extranjero. Esta alta calidad y frescura de nuestro café es conservada hasta la taza del cliente. Gracias al envasado hermético de nuestro café, bajo atmósfera modificada con nitrógeno y a la válvula de desgasificación que colocamos en cada envase. Los invitamos a deleitar su paladar degustando nuestros productos. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here, tuned from different places in Chile and abroad, to be part of International Coffee Break Session number two. My name is Marianela Peña. I'm the Student Life Coordinator at International Relations Office. The English Program and International Relations Office from Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez want to give you the warmest welcome to this event. The International Coffee Break series originated as an inviting, friendly, and interactive opportunity to engage in conversation with international speakers and, at the same time, put our English into practice. We are proud to have many students in this event. Carol Gomez, Director of the English Program in Santiago, will tell us more about this. Thanks, Marianela. I'm very excited because today we have a lot of students supporting this initiative. From Santiago, we have Mercedes, Niels, Milev, Valentina, and Daniela. And from Viña, we have Matias, Maria de los Angeles, Francisca, and Martin. Now let's welcome Mercedes and Niels. How are you guys? Hi, Carol. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Tonight, it is our pleasure to have Janiel Bitt and Pedro Centeno. Janiel is an Australian classical pianist and an entrepreneur who works at the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. Throughout the past two years, she has worked to support the most disadvantaged children in Afghanistan. She holds a Master of Teaching in Music Education. Hi Mercedes, hi everyone. Pedro Centeno is a Chilean arts administrator and award-winning pianist based in, new in Brooklyn, New York, an avid supporter of engaging aesthetic and social interventions. Pedro is academic director of the Global Leaders Program. He's preparing a rising generation of social impact focused artists to design, implement, and lead social enterprises in music. He holds a master's in music and organizational management. But before we listen to Pedro and Janil, Flor Toledo, the, di the director of English program in Viña del Mar, will tell us what our first activity is about. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to see you here. Well, we will spend the next 10 minutes in small groups. I have just sent you a PDF with a short activity, so please download it to your computer. We want to invite you to reflect on a few questions. How can music be a vehicle for action or an instrument for social impact? Could music be a way to feed the spirit of societies that are starving for change and equality? Well, I am sure you know this, right? Uh, this is a box and you know that they were very popular during the pandemic in Chile. Well, uh, boxes with food became very popular and also essential for many families. Today, we want to invite you to fill in a box, but for the spirit. 
if you could send a box to families to feed their spirits, what would you put in it? Okay, so now guys, uh, we are going to go to uh, small groups. So click Entrar or Join when you see the message on your screen. This activity takes 10 minutes only. Welcome back to the main room. We hope you have a great chat in your small groups. And uh, it doesn't matter if you, if, you, if you did it in English or Spanish, but I'm sure that you are here because something is moving you to be here. So now we are ready to leave our international guest speakers with you. So welcome, Daniel and Pedro. Hello, thank you so much for having us. Carlos, thank you for inviting us. Um, well, I would like to start by saying my name is Pedro Centeno. I am the academic director of an organization that I will be introducing briefly in a minute. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I'm from Santiago. I'm from La Reina, so really next to the Peñalolén, where the, where the campus is in Santiago. Um, so it feels as though I'm among people that I know, which uh, feels very nice. I am 28 years old. I have been in New York for the last 10 or 11 years. Um, I started my career as a classical pianist. And as soon as I graduated from high school in Santiago, I um, decided to move to the States. I had an opportunity for a full scholarship to study my undergrad as a pianist here in New York. And then after that, I completed a master's at NYU, also in music. But throughout this time, something was happening inside me because I saw extremely talented people out there that didn't really know what to do with their talent, given that the opportunities for classical uh, musicians are scarce, if we think of them tr in a traditional way. What I saw was that there was a lack of purpose a bit in the classical musicians that were working in the scene here, playing in gigs in Broadway, in Carnegie Hall, etc. They were kind of going through the motions, but I saw there was something missing. And it wasn't until I did a tour with the Orchestra of the Americas that took us to the Caribbean, uh, where I was the, the pianist of the orchestra in this tour that, that went through the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and Haiti, it wasn't until our visit to Haiti that it hit me, that there was this whole world of social impact-oriented music organizations that existed around the world, and that I had never heard about it. And so, let me step back a little bit to say that our, our our guest today, the person that I will be asking questions to today, Janelle Be, embodies this movement of music organizations that are working internationally for specific lines of impact. Okay, and why do I think this movement is important? I think this movement is crucial because it helps us give at least one possible answer to really important questions. Why does music matter? What can musicians do today in society to add value to their communities? And particularly in developing countries, why should governments spend, or philanthropists or whomever, spend on music instead of in other organizations that are solving other types of very pressing needs, right? If you think of a country in any developing region of the world, why should they invest in art, culture, music? And I think that the, the perspective that Joniel will bring to this conversation will help kind of freshen up our vocabulary or our constellation of ideas to give one possible answer to those questions. And not that those, you know, that is the only answer, but I think it's a very exciting and it's a very meaningful answer to those questions. All right, so to introduce the organization that I uh, co-founded with two other colleagues, the Global Leaders Program, seven years ago. This movement that I'm mentioning, that I'm describing, um, 
is aligned behind the idea of using music education as a platform for something else, as a platform for integrating refugee youth in the fabric of society, as a platform for rebuilding communities after natural disasters, like it's the case in Japan, or after genocides, like it is the case in Eastern Europe, or after cartel violence, drug-related violence, uh, like it is the case in May in Colombia. So the idea here is music applied to something else that is a line of social impact for a given community, okay? So seven years ago, we started getting a sense of this, this movement and started diving into the world of these organizations. And what we realized when we were going through the exploratory process was that the people leading these organizations were typically musicians, which was fine. You know, it, it makes sense that, mus that musicians are the leaders of this movement, but we realized that they lacked the training to help these initiatives thrive. When you're a musician and you're in university, all you do is sit at your instrument, right? Like all you do is just sit in front of your instrument, practice, learn about music history, learn about music theory, but never really think about what you're going to do with it later and what skills you're going to need in order to say, build a high level artistic project. So we realized that there was a, a bit of a, a gap in terms of the skill set required to help these social impact music organizations thrive and um, the abilities and the skill set that the leaders of these organizations had. So that's how the GLP, the Global Leaders Program, emerged. We are a one year fellowship that trains 60 international leaders in music uh, per year. And we have built this uh, curriculum with a series of North American university partners, including Harvard, Duke, Georgetown, NYU, et cetera. Um, so that's what I do. I am the academic director of the organization, which means I play a role in inviting guest speakers for a curriculum, design the curriculum itself, and continuing to evolve the experience that cohort members have in their program. Now, Janielle was a participant in last year's version of the Global Leaders Program. And so we had the honor to be introduced to her world, to be introduced to the world of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, which we find one of the best, if not the best case study to understand this movement of social impact on music. So Janielle, I couldn't be more excited to share this Q&A with you. Um, welcome to this space, I guess. And I have one question to, to get this conversation started, which is you are Australian. You were a recent graduate from your master's degree in music education. You're a pianist. And yet you decided to move to Afghanistan to work in the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. How did that happen and why did that happen? Hi everyone, thank you Pedro for that um, question. I could go ages on, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, and I should, I should also share a brief video about um, our institute. Um, and then I'll, ask, I'll answer the question maybe. Then that will give them a bit of an idea. But yeah, hi everybody, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I was in Chile in January and um, it's just so amazing to see all your faces and to be connected nine months later with Chile again. So um, I send you greetings from Australia, where I'm from, but I might be going back to Afghanistan soon this month. So yeah, my mind is um, fixed on going back there. So I look forward to hearing more of your questions later on in the Q&A um, and just feel free to ask. So I would like to now share a quick um, video about our institute, the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. Um, it started 10 years ago, actually, and basically the school is first and the only music institute in the country. Um, so this gives a brief idea about it. 2006, Dr. Amatsa Must then a research fellow at the Monash Asia Institute. 
in Australia initiated the revival of Afghan music, also called the Rome Project. I saw in my own life, I experienced in my own life the power of music. My father, an orphan who grew up in an orphanage, but thanks to music, his life was dramatically changed. I saw how music can transform the lives. And that was the reason for me to go back to Afghanistan to change the life of uh, other people who were in the same position. Afghanistan. A country where music has thrived for centuries. In the 1980s alone, there was a thriving pop and film music industry, hundreds of ensembles, and a unique radio orchestra with Western and Afghan instruments. All of this was destroyed by the civil war in the 1990s and its aftermath. The Taliban's came to power and completely banned all music in Afghanistan. By 1996, the country was set to total musical silence. Uh, during the Taliban time, uh, listening to music was a crime. If someone was caught listening to music, they could end up in a prison for a few days. If someone was caught uh, playing a musical instrument, they could risk getting cut their hands. But even in that time, the Taliban did not manage to prevent people from listening to music. They did not manage to fully silence the people of Afghanistan. Dr. Samast had then been in exile from his homeland for 15 years when his vision of the Afghan National Institute of Music was taken. Dr. Samast achieved the impossible, and by June 2010, the school was inaugurated. Music was brought back to the country by the people themselves. Uh, but at the same time, I discovered that there was no concrete program within the government to, for example, to rebuild musical tradition, to rebuild music education, to ensure the musical rights uh, of Afghan people, and at the same time to provide legal support for uh, creative uh, work of Afghan musicians. I'm confident that through music and education, we can provide a better future for these children. Fifteen years after the end of the Taliban regime... You're muted, Janiel. Yes, can you hear me now again? Yes. Awesome. So... To answer your question, um, you should be able to see my slide. Can you see my slide? We will in a second. It's starting to show. OK. Awesome. So I moved to Afghanistan in 2018, two years ago. And I would say that, you know, in your life, um, you may have a dream that you have when you're younger. And um, you build your way toward that dream. And you don't know when that dream is going to come to pass, but it's like that, it's a seed that is um, planted in your heart or in your mind. And for me, since I was 16, 17, I love reading books about countries that have been through war and that have been through um, genocide and this kind of circumstances. It's not that I, I like, those situations, no. But I just always had this desire to go to such places because I think I have been so blessed to um, have the chance to learn music growing up and that my parents believe that music is a gift that I can bring anywhere in the world. Um, I can do it for free. I can do it as my, as my work. And it's something that cannot be um, contained in a cage. And so I really believe that bringing music as a way of healing trauma, as a way of bringing people together, um, as a way of um, bridging divides across different cultures, um, as a way for me to travel and to do what I am passionate about and to connect with people in different places um, 
I believe that music in such places, especially, um, are so, so important. So I remember when I was 17, reading a book about um, girls' education in Afghanistan, secret girls' education during the Taliban time, when music was banned, when girls' education was banned, when chess playing was banned, dancing was banned, all of these things um, were stopped. Um, and, and I remember thinking, one day I want to go to that place and I want to work with young people there, with, um, with the next generation. And um, by, by that time when I was reading this, um, uh, 10, 10 years ago or so, um, Afghanistan had already, you know, um, not, not been controlled by the Taliban anymore but it, it's still going through conflict. And as you see in the news, even today, there are suicide bombings, there are um, attacks. Um, there are students that I teach from villages and from provinces that they can't go back to because um, the Taliban have gotten um, power over those places again. So it's still, it's still an issue, the, the conflict there. But for me, the journey of getting there was this, you know, this belief and this passion that music can change lives. Um, it's not the only answer because there are so many things um, to help a person. But as some of you mentioned in your breakout rooms earlier, um, yeah, music is something that feeds the spirit and it touches the soul and um, it helps people to process their emotions. And for me personally, that's how music has helped me. It has connected me with God. It has connected me with people. It has connected me with people who I don't even share the same language. And when I was in Chile, um, in uh, Pangipuri and Frutia earlier in the year, um, you know, connecting with people there who didn't even speak English, um, it, it, you know, it showed me again that it, it doesn't matter uh, which country you go to, but um, music is a way to to bridge those gaps um, in society and between nations. So, yeah. <laughs> I wonder, uh, you know, Lord, I, know, I think that we are very soon opening this up for Q&A, right? With, with the students. Um, I'm wondering if, Janielle, in maybe two minutes or one minute, if you could share how, because, in this, in this field, when we say music for social change, that can mean so many things. Could you tell one testimonial of a, the, the change in one student to help us understand what that means in the context of Afghanistan? Yeah, so there are many stories, um, but in particular, I love working with young women. And um, I don't know what the situation is in, in, your, in your side of things and in your country, so much, but um, for me, I see in every place that I go, usually girls, um, they, they, they don't realize their potential um, and in creative potential in a place like Afghanistan or in Africa where I have done stuff as well, um, girls are usually sidelined. And so the work that we do in the Afghanistan National Institute of Music um, really focuses also on girls having the opportunity. And um, having girls play an instrument in Afghanistan is not an easy thing, even for the new generation today, um, because they face a lot of obstacles. They face a lot of um, opposition um, from their family. Um, and for example, in our all-female orchestra, Zohra, it's called Zohra Orchestra, it started a few years ago, and it's all girls, different ages, from grade um, six until grade um, 12. And all of these girls come from completely different backgrounds. So just to paint the picture, um, quite a few of these girls are uh, sponsored children of Save the Children organization. And uh, many of them were formerly working on the streets they were selling um they were selling fruits or selling um, plastic bags or doing some of this work on the streets and they couldn't go to school but when they got sponsored they got recommended to come to our school so this also gives me a lot of joy to see um, the life of a girl who um 
before that she couldn't study she couldn't um yeah she couldn't engage that part of her mind and that part of her heart that you know like imagine if you if you that's all that is to your life but when she came to the school she now learns um different subjects because we don't just do music um it's basically like a normal school with a lot of music and so and she joins this um girls orchestra she learns to play um an a uh, western classical instrument like the flute or the piano or the violin or she can also choose an afghan traditional instrument like the afghan rubab or the afghan uh sitar the the, the long instrument that you saw um and the girls have gotten chance to travel the world so azora orchestra if you just um search it up on youtube you will see uh, many videos they have been to um different countries in europe and here is a photo of um me and the girls some of them in sweden last year and it was so cool because we were going to a concert and they were all dressed up in the afghan clothes on the streets of sweden and um it was really special and um all they they wanted to try um was mcdonald's <laughs> we don't have mcdonald's in afghanistan but um it's just a completely a different world but the thing that changes um a girl's life is them realizing their their um capacity their potential and that um identity in them that is a uh, creative and that can change their world as well around them and that they are not powerless um but that they can do something for themselves and also for their sisters and the, and their family um in the, in this regard to music and education um and one of the young one of the the young women that i that i have known she was um one of the conductors of zora orchestra she has now moved to another country and gotten a scholarship to study international uh relations which is also her passion um but she had a very difficult time studying at our school because um her her family didn't support it and um she came to a point where they were telling her even to stop school and to leave school and this happens a lot by the time they reach the age of 15 16 it's like the family may say it's enough now um you should now stay at home again or you should um start to prepare to get engaged and um as you know early marriages um and that kind of issue it still happens in afghanistan so um this particular student she decided to um to to make a stand and it was not easy but she really believed that her life has changed now she sees things in a different way she couldn't go back and she couldn't um just get married and give up you know this amazing um thing that she has discovered and with this amazing thing that she discovered she realized that she can also do other things and and now she's doing international relations and she has a passion to go to different countries and to sort of be an ambassador for her country as well and to help other young women and so um her life her life changed by making that stand and you know for for me as a teacher um this is why i am there as well to see that the students can discover more in themselves and also in their own culture as you see in this photo here this is another very important part of what we do is that we 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 bring up um afghan music and it's not that afghanistan never had music or they didn't have a, a rich culture they have it so rich you can't imagine it's like it goes back um hundreds of years and so the instruments that they have that you see in this picture um these are just some of the many instruments that they have so part of our work is also preserving that and helping our students see that they can be cultural ambassadors for afghanistan and show also the world a different side of this country apart from what people see in the media
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I see there are a couple of hands that have been raised when you were speaking, Janelle. So maybe we can start hearing from students. What do you say? Good. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Pedro and Janelle, for that inspiring talk. And as Pedro said, now it's time for questions. We want to invite our audience to share their insights with us by raising hands or typing your questions in the chat box. Question is from uh, Lucas Rodriguez. Hello? Um, hello? Hi. Is it? Is it? Okay. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm mind blown. <laughs> I had no idea about any of this. So this is... Um, incredible to me so congratulations and to both of you to how far you've come um to make it uh, a summary brief my question is um so when you went to afghanistan you know how when you go to an, another country you have a cultural shock kind of D did you have that but with music like did you know what you were getting into or did did you learn something maybe from your students as well or was it all like yeah. What a great question, Lucas. Thank you. Um, oh my gosh, it you know it's um it's a completely different world and life. And um, I get asked this question a lot. For me, as I said, since I was younger, I, I I read a lot about Afghanistan. I already had that seed planted in me, and so the cultural stuff and all that. I sort of um I had an idea. And also in Melbourne itself, I have a lot of Afghan refugee friends who um, have come here because of the, them trying to escape um, the war and the conflict there. So I also started off in my own country, reaching out to Afghans here. And so I knew when I went to their house, they're, um, they're, they're sitting on the floor. It's all on the floor. They eat um, on, the, on the floor, on the carpets, and it's, it's so nice. And so there are amazing things about their culture that I already knew. But then now going there to Afghanistan, that's also some things that my Afghan friends in Australia say, are you crazy? <laughs> like, why would you want to go um, to my country? And um, I would say that the biggest um, changes for me as a woman as well is that I have to wear a scarf. Um, I have to wear long sleeves. I changed my whole wardrobe <laughs> and I do enjoy putting my hair down when I'm back here and walking um, freely. Um, other things are that when I'm with um, people um, outside going um, out somewhere, that is also difficult. So I can't just um, walk out anywhere I want um, because of the security situation. And um, when I'm out uh, with with people with some friends I also have to be careful and um, usually for women there as well we don't laugh in public or we don't um, talk loudly or you know you, you don't feel so free so those are the things I had to deal with and um, teaching there that was the, the joy that was the part that was um, I can deal with all of these things <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there were many, there are many things that I had to learn to deal with and learn along the way. We have a question from Florencia Jara. Do you want to share one with us? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Well, I've had some issues with my internet, so I don't know if you already, if you already talked about this. <laughs> Hope you didn't. <laughs> but um, well, you were saying how this is a social thing right like this is not this young girl's problem <laughs> it's a it's a whole society thing so my question is how how do you believe how can you change um maybe these girls families mind <laughs> about music or about going to this school what's the next step to, in order to expand <laughs> this way of thinking what an amazing question. Thank you for that amazing question. So I, I say I always wrestle with such a question because living and working in a place like this, you are bound to have days where you're like, is it worth it? Um, is, you know, people are still fighting, the war is still going on. And then we have the social issues as well, this social 
this cultural um, war of ideas as well. And so if it's a war of ideas on, on that level, um, music definitely does, does something. Music, um, as our founder, Dr. Samas, often says, music is a soft power. So in convincing people, um, we show them something already. We show them something different. And for example, in reaching the, fa um, the families, yes, that's a, that's a very difficult thing um, because it's not just even their immediate family, it's the uncles, the aunties, the grandparents, um, even neighbors. There are students who can't tell um, their neighbors um, or their friends or their cousins that they do music. So yes, it's tricky. But we have seen so much change in the last 10 years um, in Afghanistan itself, um, especially in the capital city. There have been a lot of um, changes for, for women and for men as well, but especially seeing um, some men rise up and also speak up on behalf of women. And one of the best things I have seen is to see our young men in our school stand up for the girls as well and whenever we have performance for them to to also esteem the girls um, not in a condescending way but for them to say that we are here all equals in this orchestra we are playing music together we need each other and there's even um a, a, a one a boy uh the concert um the the concert uh, master the, vi uh, the violinist who of the orchestra who, who one day said to me, yeah, teacher, you know, our, our girls, like, they're even better than us. So, you know, in playing the violin or, you know, he, he becomes humble now when he realizes that the girls can be just as good or even better. And it doesn't matter that, you know, they're a girl. And if anything, they now have more respect because they realize that it's harder for a girl in many ways. And so, um, the way I see it is that when these these students come to our school, they learn to see each other differently, and they bring that those um, attitudes. They bring it back to their family slowly um, by slowly. And the way that the boys may treat their sisters, um, the way that they may see women, um, that also changes because of their interactions um, in in the music space. Yeah. Something else. If I may just. Uh, intrude. Um, something else that I love about the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, um, there's the change of the individual, what you're referring to, Janiel, what it does to the young girls, the young girls' families, and the student body, and their perceptions. There's another change, which is, I live in New York, right, forever, everything that we have heard in relation to Afghanistan has been what? Has been war, conflict, you know, death. It has been all these negative things. So now that there's this all-female orchestra that blends Western and Afghan traditions, you have cellos, violins, and sitars, et cetera, um, representing not in terms of cultural diplomacy there is something else that's happening to the world through this institute right we are changing our perception and we are placing afghanistan in a conversation that it wasn't before right why is there an all-female orchestra let's have a conversation about women in afghanistan what is that reality like and so it's become kind of a tool for cultural diplomacy of the country representing it as something other than conflict, um, which mm -hmm. is a, yes. another thing. Daniel, the next question is from Stefano Londero. He raised his hand. Yeah, I'm here. Wait a second. Okay. Hi, I'm Stefano. I'm 22. <laughs> I was listening while making some uh, or doing in my house. So, um, well, uh, I want to ask both of you because I got to this talk uh, with a message in a group and I'm developing uh, actually here in Chile uh, now a project with a couple of friends that are older than me. I'm the youngest and we are trying to um, like um, record and help uh, uh, producing music to uh, young uh, people and also older here in, in Santiago first. 
uh, we are building a, a music studio. Uh, we finished it uh, last week um, with a microphone, cameras, and uh, I'm buying a lot of equipment <laughs> this week and the next one. And well, this was like a little surprise. And when I I heard like all the challenges uh, Daniel had to to uh, take. Like transferring from Australia to a an, an, an adult culture in, in Afghanistan. Here, at least in, in Chile, uh, um, I have been talking with a lot of, a lot of artists and there's uh, also um, a lack of um, support from the government and from uh, private entities uh, to make um, um, like musicians and artists um, raised in in society here so it's very difficult to live with music and being a musician and earning your life making music so we are trying to like change that with uh, this new project um so my question is um you went to a country where it was really difficult to make uh, people live and feel music as part of their life because of all the culture so what's your advice um, to enter a, a market where music is not valued and you can't earn a, a living because of cultural things, just that uh, Afghanistan is way worse than Chile in that terms of cultural um, inequality and also the, the, the barrier, like the entrance barrier is higher. So if you could make it in a country where music was banned, how can we make it in a country where music is not banned and we are known for having a lot of musical uh, and cultural uh, things. For example, we have music in the North, uh, La Tirana, if you can see those, those f uh, festivals. And then we have in, in the South, uh, things like Cuega or uh, Bailes Chilodes, that is um, like cultural dances all over the country. So how can we make those people live with their music and how can we help them? What, what are the main issues young people have? Uh, and yeah, so like that, that will be my, my long answer, uh, my long question. So for, for both of you, because one is uh, Jose Pedro is Chilean, so he can help me with the Chilean way. And uh, you, you have been in a country where it's more difficult than here. Do you want to go first, Janiel? Okay, wow. I'm sort of dying to answer that question. I love this group floor and Carlos. It's just amazing the questions you're asking and the way you are taking initiative in your life. I just love that. Thank you, Stefano. So um, as an example, I've been working on something um, called Music Makers for Peace. And it's something I've been working on the past year. And um, initially this idea was for Africa and to do it in schools there. and um, during this pandemic, I realized that, oh, everything is online now, what should I do? And I have a passion for writing songs. Um, there was someone in one of the breakout rooms that mentioned um, putting song lyrics in that box. And I just love that because for me, I'm thinking, how, how can I translate music to very normal life and to very, a low resource context or to context where you know people listen to music these days on their headphones they engage with music in just that way is there any other way that they can engage with music um not just in that orchestra level not just in a music studio or in a um, festival level um which is like very one-off um but people like you are trying to give opportunities um through your music studio um, um, service and you want to empower young musicians to have such an opportunity right so for me as an educator I often think how do I empower young people to translate um, music the music they're listening to and to exercise creative um, agency their own creativity in something that they can do they can start with it so for me I realized that songwriting is one thing it's um, something that you know, people may already do, but they keep it a bit secret because they feel shy about it. Um, so I'm working on a, on a workshop series called Song Write for Peace. And I'm starting with um, a bunch of um, young people, even here in Australia, 
who are of refugee backgrounds, and I'm doing another one connecting um, young people in uh, different parts of Africa and connecting them through songwriting for peace, meaning that we can choose a topic, a social issue or a social challenge and to go with that. So um, on my side, I would say that um, you have to think in Chile or in your particular context, just narrow it down. What's the target that you're looking, that you're aiming to help and to reach out to? And what are some ways that through your music um, production thing, um, you, can, you can connect it with songwriting maybe, you can connect it with um, making tracks and some of these things and just translate it in such a way that maybe in the future you could even bring your service into schools. And it's something that, you know, people realize it can help them. It's a way of expressing themselves. It's like therapy um, because music is therapy in that way. And in that way, you can, you can convince school principals, you can convince parents, because young people these days face you know, all kinds of mental health issues. And you can advocate for music as a way to strengthen someone's well-being. And um, for me, another thing is music develops intrinsic motivation in someone. You don't need to tell them to do it. They just do it themselves because they love it. So yeah, thank you for that great question. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Stefano. And I'm hearing from uh, UAI, from, from somebody in the staff, that there is room for one more question. Yes. Yes, indeed. It's time for the last question of the day. And this question is from Andrea Jarron that has her hand raised. So, Andrea. Um, hi. Thank you both so much for this. It's been amazing. Um, I wanted to ask Janiel, because you were talking about the struggles with the families and how women are treated over there. And I was wondering if you've ever had to face like attacks from the families of the girls, like wanting to shut down the Institute because it's like too revolutionary or something. If you've had like real struggles with that, like confrontative um, attitudes maybe. Yeah, so um, parents and families is one thing. Um, and then on the other hand, there is the, the larger thing like the insurgent groups. So um, with families, like a lot has changed and we're seeing a lot of positive changes. But like with that student that I mentioned, um, the girl conductor, um, when, when the family wanted her to stop uh, studying at the school, um, quite a number of them came to the school and was demanding that she she leave and so that was not nice but I, I don't think we've had something like that um, recently so there has been a lot of positive changes um, but definitely on social media like I hear um, the, my founder um, he often says that at the beginning it was so hard because you know people would accuse um, these students of things um, online when they see some of the stuff we're doing um, and they would say really nasty things um, about our students and about our school, about our teachers. So we have to deal with that. Um, but like I said, a lot has changed now and our students have even appeared on the national TV and um, all, all of this um, media spaces, um, we are known now. So there's still danger in that, but we, we, are, you know, we take that, that risk because um, I often say my students are the first, like the front line, the first generation of musicians to do this again. Um, and then on the other hand, the larger thing, which is the thing that you may, you will still see in the news, um, is that a few years ago in 2014, there was a bombing of uh, one of our concerts. And um, it was, yeah, it was terrible. That was related with the Taliban. And um, so these, these threats are there. And so we always have to be careful. We can't, uh, we can't have concerts the way that we do in, in our countries. And we have to be really careful how we have it, where we have it. And it has to be very sort of secret. Um, so yeah, those things are still being dealt with on that front. Thank you. Well, we would like to thank our guests for sharing their wonderful experience this evening. If you'd like to keep in touch, follow Afghanistan National Institute of Music and Global Leaders Program on Instagram. Pedro, Janil, would you like to share a final thought with us? 
it was inspiring to see in every group that I joined in the breakout groups that every single group thinks that music is necessary for the spirit. Um, so thank you for that, for, for hearing that, hearing this from your generation means the world. Uh, it helps validate our work and the importance of our work. Um, and I want to thank again, Flor, Carlos and the team at, at Adolfo Ibanez for making this possibility for General and I to speak. Thank you. Thank you all again for having us. And um, it's really special to see this dynamic group of young people. I'm sure all of you, um, if we were to sit down and talk with each person, you have your own dreams and goals and visions. Um, I would just like to say an encouragement that though in this time we seem stuck, but like I shared the idea that I was working on as Stefano shared his idea that he's been working on, there are things that are germinating um, in this incubation time that um, there's a lot of potential. So don't miss this time for anything, um, though you may be discouraged on some days, but I hope that um, when you listen to music, you remember that there are people like us doing music in, in really tough places. And um, yeah, that, that you can do your part for um, Chile and for your continent and the, the people that matter to you as well. So thank you for having us and I wish you all the best. We would love to continue talking to Pedro and Janil and sharing with the great attendees we had today. But before we leave, we are more than happy to award one of our students for her active and insightful participation this evening. So Florencia Jara, congratulations. You are today's winner of Cafe Caribe International Coffee Break Pack. We will be contacting you soon to send it to your home. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks again, everybody, for participating in our second Coffee Break Talk. And we will look forward to see you in our next one, the 8th of October. Next month, we'll be talking about the Chilean social unrest. So don't miss it. And before you leave, please answer our quick survey we just shared with you. It won't take you more than two minutes. We want to know your opinion. Thank you again, and see you in the next Coffee Break. Bye, everyone. <laughs>